to welcome two people who are running the global media and uh, customer consumer engagement for two very large global organizations, Unilever and Mondelez, who are going to be showing us some of their latest and most stimulating work and reflecting on some of the issues of the last two days with myself and Oliver listening in, chipping in with a few questions. Would you like to do that? I'd love to co-host. Okay, lovely. We're co-hosting. So, are you ready to stand? Come on, guys. JL Shooter <laughs> and Bonin Boff, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> How are you, sir? <laughs> it's always good to see you. Come on. Ciao, okay. Roma! Yeah. How are you? Okay, right. stand at the lectern, that's yours. Oh, we're standing now, okay. Yeah, you're the lecterns, boys. I was actually told I couldn't say ciao, Roma, I have to say, hello, Festival of Media! <laughs> that's what I was told, but anyway. Excellent. Okay, let's see if this works, because I don't know whether it's Yeah, I'm questioning work. it too, by the way. I don't know, we can, we can wing it. Okay, all right, guys. Um, Oliver's talked a lot about new ways of looking at social, okay? How are you changing your businesses, your media spend? to respond to this new social world? Bonin. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think, I think you guys, many of you are probably familiar with um, the work that we've done. Um, actually, you know what, let's just jump into a video, then I'll come back and talk about how we're changing. Cool. Can, can we play the YouTube clip from the... Bonin's one of my heroes, movie? by the way. What I mean, Oreo, come on. Yeah. Super so, Bowl. Is that the YouTube clip for Honeymade? So this is some work that we just did on a Honeymade brand. So we released a, a, a TV spot, and in real time we got feedback around the TV spot, and then we created a piece of video content to respond back to those who were talking about the TV. I'll, I'll let it play and then I'll come back. Am I gonna let it play or am I? I share that piece is because it is the manifestation of a march that we as an organization have been on over the last two years. So many people are familiar with Oreo Daily Twist, where for 100 days we created a piece of content that represented culture. It launched with a rainbow cookie. That rainbow cookie, as a, a, a brand, we already had 33 million Facebook fans, but that rainbow cookie added another million Facebook fans and almost 10 million actions in 24 hours. It continued to show the organization the power of social. But more important than that, and then you cut to what we did at Super Bowl, where the You Can Still Dunk in the Dark, which was released four minutes after the lights went out on the Super Bowl, considered the tweet heard around the world. What everybody asked me is, oh my god, how are you guys ready for the Super Bowl? And I said, well, didn't you see what we did for the last 100 days when we launched Daily Twist? But in reality, what we were doing as an organization was building the muscle memory necessary to operate in real time. We were understanding what the process looked like. We were understanding legal. We were understanding the confidence that was necessary for our people to be able to operate and create in real time. We were understanding the complexity of working with agencies in a new way. And as a result, we've been systematically rolling that muscle memory out brand after brand. 
We have probably one of the best case studies on Nilla wafers in terms of driving the business of a brand just using Facebook and driving a $140 million business by 10%. Um, and this is the latest manifestation. And what I love about this was that because we have this agility process around participation in social, because we're always on, because we're always prepared to create content and leverage influencers, I think a lot of the stuff that Oliver talked about, we saw a negative comment coming from what was you know, same-sex relationships being shown in a commercial, and we were able to respond with something which I think is an even more beautiful piece of film than what people were responding to at first. And so this now has four million views in the last three days, and it's right now on fire. So I think it kind of points to, as a business, we have already restructured our process and our approach on a global level. To be well, The other thing that most people don't know is when you think about Daily Twist, we were doing that in five other countries as well. So it was really 500 pieces of content that were created over 100 days. So we've been on a systematic march to reinvent the processes necessary to participate when, in real when time. When you saw the negativity coming in from that campaign, who took the decision to, to respond in the way you responded? I wish I could say me, but no, I'm just kidding. It's the, no, the brand, the brand teams. So the brand teams, I also think, you know, we've talked a lot about Fearless. We've, we've launched events at Can called Fearless. We've talked about Fearless marketers. We support and hold up marketers in the organization who are Fearless. I think what you've seen is a wholehearted culture change to we have to be brave and we have to believe that our brands can have a bigger voice in culture than they used to ever before. And so we have to make those kind of brave decisions. I could show that, a lot of work that yeah. was brave decisions. Hold on. Yeah. We'll, we'll so, go ahead. Go ahead. I have a question. Is this, you know, it reminds me a lot of what went on at Disney, you know, just kind of having to be the insurgent there. Are you doing this from inside of the company out, or is it being influenced by agencies? It's inside or, are out. Are they following you? Uh, it's inside out. Yeah. I believe that you are the, you get the agency you deserve as a client. And I think that, hmm. to be perfectly honest with you, at mm -hmm. this moment and point in time right now, I think it's incumbent on clients to help change the industry. Yep. And I think that, I agree. you know, look, I left the agency side because clients are too stupid to buy good work, right? That's why I left, so I became a dumb client. But at the same time, I realized that as a client, we actually have an obligation to show where the North Star is because the agency ecosystem will not change unless we ask for change, right. unless we force change, because we write the checks. That's okay. right. Fair enough. While we're on the subject of love, yes, yes. Jay, um, let's take a little look at um, the cupidity work for Cornetto, and uh, I'd love, love to hear your, uh, your opinions on that after we've seen the, seen the case. You'll like this, Oliver. This is... To I truly know. love the ending, <laughs> first we've got to take our fearless romantics on a ride that they won't just enjoy, but that they can take ownership of, creating an unprecedented social conversation. Because this year, we stand alongside our teammates, exploring every moment together, facing every challenge and charm that love can throw away, partners from top to tip. We take our first bite with the films themselves, at the heart of each one, a beautiful truth of love. Excitement, trepidation, exhilaration, frustration, and each with a subtle connection to our influences, like a song that gives courage or lends words to heartbreak. As each love story plays out, our influences then have the perfect platform to join the conversation actively and authentically, sharing their experiences of love with our fearless romantics. Imagine Taylor Swift, queen of breakups, helping you back into the race. Or Red Boom, sharing his finest pickup lines. Each one sharing something on a level with our teams, helping them to navigate uncharted territory. The trusted confidants, the bean mares, the dunnats. A conversation powered by the theory of love. But what use is theory without practice? Our influencers can fuel the conversation further, giving ways for our fearless romantics to dive in without danger. From hangout date demos to chat up line trials, we'll provide the testing grounds across multiple platforms to help our teams out into the world more fearlessly than ever. Wherever the conversation happens, our Facebook page keeps track of everything in real time, giving every team a touch point no matter where they're joining in from. And the ride doesn't slow down there. Extending from every touch point, we'll create tools for our teams, like hashtags, four by films, and Instagram filters, tools that make stepping out into the world just that much easier and give our fearless romantics a perfect place to add to the conversation in their own unique ways. Their stories, their pictures, their updates, their feelings, all fueling a global conversation that they own and direct. 
a conversation so huge that it'll even start to touch other stories from around the internet. And a conversation so connected, it'll grow from every touchpoint, no matter how or where our audience joins in with cupidity. And then, when the time finally comes to love the ending, comes an ending powered by love. The cupidity counting. A portrait of love from across the world, beating in real time with the emotions of the internet. How many first dates are happening? How many hearts are looking for love? And how many are already loving every moment? It's every aspect of love, from our films and beyond, alive in front of the eyes of our fearless romantics, proving once and for all that they're not alone in this, and showing what happens to the world when people simply go ahead and dive into cupidity. You told me I can't ask any questions. <laughs> now, I know, that, I know that the audience has been involved in that, so I've told Oliver he can't, he's not allowed to ask a Tell us a bit about the strategy behind that, and how, how long is this, this going to run for? Yeah, I mean, if you wouldn't mind, I, I just want to take a, a one step back and just talk about how Unilever as an organization got to, to this stage, yeah. and then I can talk a little bit more about Cornetto. But Unilever has a, uh, an operating marketing communications philosophy now. It's called Crafting Brands for Life in a Connected World. And there's three transformational shifts for us inside the organization. The first pillar is what we call putting people first, and, and it's really the, the people that we want to talk about. It's not about talking to consumers. People only consume our brands at best a couple minutes a, of every day. So we need to understand the fundamental truths behind people and how they operate. Second, it's about building brand loves. For us, that, that's really about moving from just a, a product to buy to an idea to buy into. So this is about building brands with, with purpose. In the case of Cornetto, this is about building brands that talk about love one of the most important emotions and one of the most important philosophies that exist. The third pillar for us is about unlocking the magic. And this is really about taking the, the best of what exists in, in marketing and, and what is universal, the last hundred years of, of marketing, but overlaying and embedding, applying the new tools and principles to, to the world. And that's how we get to, to work like this. So for Conetto, it's actually really interesting in that I would say five years ago, we would work with uh, an agency in, in Lola and make an unbelievable 30-second spot. What you haven't seen here is that what we did is we, trans we uh, shifted from 30-second spots to films, to five-minute branded entertainment pieces. And it actually wasn't just one piece done by the agency, but we took that brief and then gave it out to a community of filmmakers. We have 10 amazing pieces of, of branded film. And then when we put that in the community, we turn those pieces of film into other pieces of art, music videos, uh, Instagram profiles. And then we put this out into the, to the social sphere and had people listen and respond. And so we picked up on themes, organic conversations that were happening about love uh, every day and turned that into a social phenomenon. And um, how are you gauging success for this, Jay? Well, we, uh, we're Unilever. As every big corporation, it's two pieces. So one is looking at sales, and we can track this back to, to sales. Uh, and saliency is a, is a great hook back into sales, but also brand equity. So measuring uh, how relevant the, the, the brand is uh, in the world. So it's really about brand equity shift as well as uh, moving packaging. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Let's, um, let's just move on a the little theme here, just slightly beyond social. We've been talking a lot over the last couple of days about the interaction between TV and Twitter, and we've been talking a lot about how the media landscape is changing, and I just want to focus on a couple of case studies um, which demonstrate really how you're starting to see the changes in your own organizations. Explain a little bit about what you did with Trident. Sure. Um, and then I guess we'll let the video play. Is that what you want to do? Sure. Uh, so, you know, we signed a pretty landmark deal with Twitter. Um, we firmly believe that that combination, well, let me, let me, actually, let me step back. As we looked over the last five years at our marketing mix models, and we went through hundreds of them, the one thing that we saw was consistent was that on television, we were hitting a point of diminishing return earlier and earlier on our investments. But when you actually think about consumer consumption, it's up. And so there's this weird, what was happening here? So as we began to look deeper, one of the correlations we believe is that at the end of the day, consumer engagement is down on our 30-second spots, not on the content that our TV uh, broadcast partners are creating, but on our 30-second spot. Because now, the moment a TV commercial comes on, it signals one thing to everybody in the world. Boom, oh, it's time to text. That's exactly what time it is, is to send emails. 
So as we began to look at that phenomenon, we said we could either see <coughs> this device as a challenge or we could see it as an opportunity. So we began to run very systematic tests with Twitter or with mobile and social. We began to see if we were actually participating in social at the same time as TV, we could see twice the effectiveness of our television commercial. So to put it in perspective, on average, if a, CD, if a CPG company or FMCG company spends 70 to 80% of their media on TV, imagine being able to make that work twice as hard. So we began to realize that was a step change. So <clears throat> on Trident, we set out to say, well, instead of it just being commercials tied to Twitter in that conversation, we launched our partnership with Twitter and actually built the first TV show that was based on Twitter conversation and then fed back into the Twitter network. So why don't we let the video play real quick and then, okay, Trident. <coughs> Trident are so excited about this partnership with Fuse and Twitter. Historically, what's happened on TV has driven the conversation in social media. Today, what we're about to do is use what's happening in social media to help drive television. Media consumption for millennials these days is becoming more and more complicated, more and more diverse, and more and more exciting. We at Trident are committed to being part of the multi-screen environment, and we are committed to leading and helping our consumers engage with our brand. No more making you know, data <coughs> for billboards or 30-second spots or magazine ads that take weeks and weeks and weeks. How do you create thousands of little pieces that tell stories or different stories that accumulate to making the impact on the consumer that you were looking for? This program really takes content creation to the next level. We're actually looking at the data on Twitter, identifying those trending topics. Fuse's team is going to be sorting through this data and coming up with those really interesting stories. People will be responding, driving an amazing conversation and editorial voice around what's happening, and then that actually will come to television. So that cycle of TV to Twitter and back to TV is something that we haven't seen before. Welcome to the Fuse Studios. This is where we shoot Trending 10 and get the world up to speed on what's happening with music on Twitter. Fuse control room. In order to get a show like the Trending 10 on the air every day, we've kind of changed the workflow process from the studio down here. Starting at 7 o'clock in the morning, people are coming in and combing through things that are spiking the heat tracker. The team putting together and writing stories and getting a clip up online right away just to get more content out daily and closer to when the action's happening. So really, it's a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week um, information exchange with consumers. You can, you can cut it here. You can cut it. I'm the next person in the video, so you have me in real life, so why let the video play? So just to give you kind of just a, a quick recap, so basically what we did is we know TV integration deliver higher ROI. We also know that TV and Twitter are raising our ROI. So what we wanted to do was bring those two together. So we worked with Fuse to create a music show um, which is based on Twitter conversation. We work with Twitter to create a heat tracker, which shows the differential of conversation, not just who has the most, because Justin Bieber would win. I bet you one of those, those bright lights on that dot had to be Bieber. Anyway. He's, uh, he's dimming. He's I'm starting to dim a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so what was the real delta? And then we take that conversation. We come in at 7 in the morning, so we reinvented the studio situation. We come in at 7 in the morning, and they actually take real tweets from real consumers, and they create 10 uh, different pieces around 10 trends, a half-hour segment that airs at 9 a.m. If we were to just do that show with Fuse, which is the largest music network, just bought by JLo, but anyway, largest music network, um, then we would reach 18% of the target demographic, right? But the fact that we then tied it to Twitter, we were able to reach 50% of the target demographic. So what we do is after that show airs at 9 o'clock, we then cut it up into 22 different pieces of trending co uh, content, and we send that across Twitter. So we're basically taking our core video asset, and then we're cutting that up, and we're shipping it across Twitter. What's beautiful about that is when you think about gum, the only device you have close to the point of buying is that mobile phone. So now I'm able to target you on commute, target you during lunchtime, target you when you're really close uh, to that point of buying. The other piece that we learned from there, and, and Gary alluded to it, is creating micro content. So we learned quickly that people didn't want to watch the same 15 second Trident spot on the front of 22 pieces of content. So we worked with Vine creators, and we created six second, 22 pieces of six second content every single day for nine months. What I thought was spectacular about, well, first of all, you know, lightweight content, real time, throwaway, tied to culture, was relevant to what was in that two to three minute clip. 
The other thing I thought was awesome is that the scale of these vine creators. So to your point, some of them have 7 million people. And so we were getting views in a week of 20, 30 million, which is bigger than being on a premiere of any one of the major TV shows. So I think um, the real point here is how do you begin to not just leverage conversation that's happening in Twitter, but begin to be very systematic about creating ways to participate with that connection between TV and Twitter. Sorry. Thank you. Jay, um, you have been doing some interesting experimentation on trying to understand the links between mobile and radio, talking of the fusion. Mm. It doesn't just have to be TV and Twitter, other media emerging as well. We had Bob Pittman, global CEO of Clear Channel, speaking at the conference uh, yesterday. So very interested in hearing some insights on what have you been doing there. Yeah, I mean, as a company, I mean, we, we realize that one of the, the biggest opportunities uh, is mobility. So how mobile phones are changing consumer behavior, and especially in the developing and emerging world. We know that there's a, a lot of media dark areas that, that exist. Uh, Bihar, India is, is one. And uh, we, we go out there, we do consumer connects. I mean, we, we realize these, these people are on the, the lower rungs of, uh, of uh, economic society. Yeah? And they don't necessarily have uh, reliable electricity, running water. Uh, you know, televisions are not, are not that prominent, some people are illiterate, you know, so we can't use our, our traditional forms of, of mass media. It's tough for us to, to use television, 30 second spots, it's tough for us to use billboards, it's tough for us to use print. But what we do know is that everybody has a mobile phone. Now I would say that a couple years ago, you know, we wouldn't necessarily thought uh, as broadly. You know, we would think about just mobile and how we deliver uh, a banner ad or, you know, kind of a repurposed print ad to, uh, on a small screen or a text message which is great, we do a lot of uh, very contextual uh, SMS-based messaging, that, that works fantastic, but we understood based on the, the people that we, we serve that what they were missing actually was, was a fantastic piece of entertainment. And so what I would call it, this is, is a little bit of back to the future. So how could we think about creating a media channel, an owned media channel where we can deliver our own content and actually deliver uh, advertising and value through that as a way to uh, you know, not only deliver entertainment, and deliver some, some brand messages. But you know, we can actually kind of use that through the, the path to purchase, and people can take those information, take our, our product information, and actually purchase right on the site. Cool. Let's, uh, what we're going to do is we're running so tight for time, but I know you're all really interested in hearing what the guys have to say. We'll run this tape. We may just cut it off a little bit, and then we have one or two final questions. And I'd like to finish with uh, a little bit of purpose, OK? OK, great. Thanks. Um, let's run the tape. So we're talking about, uh, yes, that one. मोबाइल पर कॉल आ रहा था कनखजूर वाला जो गाना जो बोलता है वही गाना के बारे में बता रहा था जगह जगह पे बैनर वगैरह लगे हुए हैं इसलिए हम इस कॉल करने के लिए कि गाना सुनाया जाता है कुछ डिटेल बताए मैं इस एड को एक पेपर में न्यूज पेपर में देखी थी टीवी पे बॉस मूवी है ना उसका एडवरटाइजिंग आता है ना तो वहीं पे मैंने देखा था जो नया फिल्म आ रहा है उन उसके सॉन्ग सुने बॉस फिल्म का चुटकुले भी आ रहा था उसमें अगर अपने हस्बैंड की जिंदगी चाहते हो तो 1800 डॉलर दो वरना उसके 30000 टुकड़े करके 1 2 3 यानी अंग्रेजी में एक दो तीन कर देंगे इसमें बहुत सारे एडवर्टाइजिंग आते हैं लाइव बॉय लक्स फिर क्लोज अप वगैरह थैंक यू what a fantastic, it just shows you don't need sophisticated digital technology to be creative mm -hmm. in the way you think about your brands. The, uh, the one bit at the end is just the, the point about scale. So, I mean, within uh, 15 days, we got about 5 million people wow. that were calling, uh, and our goal is to get to 50 million users, 50 million active engaged users by the end of this year. 
wow. bigger than any uh, television channel that exists in, in India right now. You know, it's interesting because if, if I came to you as a TV executive in the 1950s and I said, I want you to buy this thing called television, you'd be like, whoa, television, this radio thing I have seems to be working really, really well for me. But three brave companies, Unilever, P&G, and Kraft, made the bold move because they saw consumer consumption was eclipsing where spending was, and so they jumped into television. And if you look, we're in that same period right now where 24% of media is consumed on a mobile device, but less than 1% of spending goes there. And so there's this huge delta in opportunity for organizations. And I get the same question. I'm glad you brought up scale. I always get, well, is it at scale? And so, you know, we did some research, and there are 7 billion people on Earth, 5.1 billion own a mobile phone, and only 4.1 own a toothbrush which means two things. One, that a billion people didn't get the text message on the importance of hygiene, but number two, that clearly mobile phones are at scale. So we made a pretty concentrated effort two years ago to go after what we call getting to 10, which is investing 10% of all of our media money in mobility because, as Unilever uh, pointed out, it will transform how we work as an organization. And I think that it's interesting because I still think there's such a lag in the industry right now in terms of mobile investment. I don't under, I can't, I, it baffles me. It may be 10 now. When does it get to 50? I think it should be, I mean, if, you, if it was my, if I was the sole decision maker in the situation, then I, I, think, I think realistically in those ranges of 30, you know, I don't know about 50 quite yet, maybe it gets there in the next five years. But I mean, when I look at what we're doing in India, so we're doing a lot of missed call stuff too, it's so powerful. You're talking about 860 million users, only 100 million have smartphones, but the rest all have phones. Missed call, how basic is that? Pfft, I'm like, I wish I invented that. You leave a missed call and we call you back yeah, and it's on our back. It's huge. The scale is huge. Brilliant. Can we show that one 3D? Uh, no, go ahead. <laughs> We've got some great things to show, but we're going to have to show them uh, after or individually. Maybe we show them later on, mm. or through Cream or M&M. Which one did you want to show? No, I just wanted to show the trending vending, the 3D printer, the Oreo 3D printer. Oh, did you really? I'm just too greedy. Do you want to see the 3D printing? Yes. <laughs> see? Okay, we're going to show. I'm really sorry to the... Uh, and then the final question goes to Mr. Oliver Luckett, to our two wonderful speakers. Uh -oh. um, let's show, we're going to show the trending video. two. Oh, let's show the, for, for video one. Okay. We asked yesterday whether Lego was worried about 3D printing. Do you remember the question? Did you remember the answer? Let's see what uh, Mondelez is thinking about that. Trending vending. South by Southwest Interactive in Austin, Texas. We invited festival goers to the Trending Vending Lounge to participate in an experiment. What would happen if your Oreo cookie joins a social network? Our prototype vending machines take what's trending on Twitter and turns those trends into custom Oreos. Using unique transparent touch screens, users scroll through a list of trending topics, each related to a particular flavor combination and pattern. Advanced algorithms translate the tweets into custom cookies. In all, there are about 10,000 possible combinations. Users can also mash up two trends to further customize the experience. The resulting cookie combines elements of the two original trends. Once the user hits make cookie, the real magic happens. Using some repurposed 3D printing technology and a pneumatic pump system, we've enabled festival attendees to watch their custom cookie as it's robotically printed and assembled. Final cookie is dropped into a cup, vended, and is now ready to enjoy. She's wearing Google Glass while she's here. Yeah, Glass hole, right? <laughs> so, you know, we were going to show a second video that shows more excitement in terms of like the entire space and the experience. We had a milk bar, so on and so forth. But I think what the most important thing is here is that we were experimenting with how do you actually. So we call this eat the tweet, right? So how do you actually take a social experience and actually bring it all the way down to the product level? So imagine watching 
a soccer match and you see an Oreo cookie ad and then you have conversation on Twitter around it and Oreo is a part of it and you could actually eventually go to the store and buy that entire consumer experience. And we think that being able to bring it down to the product level is part of the future. It's interesting, customization is huge now too. So we had two machines running. One, we were just choosing the trends and printing the cookie. So you could go, first of all, this thing is like Willy Wonka. I've never seen anything like it. I thought I was blown away. Um, when you, when you, you could walk up, watch it print, and then taste the cookie. Same exact experience. The other one you could actually scroll and customize and create your own. Nobody went to this first machine. There was a two and a half hour wait at South by Southwest, which is a very cynical crowd, to customize their Oreo because people wanted to have the experience of tasting and customizing a product that they put together. So very exciting. Very interesting thought. Okay, the final question goes to Oliver to R2B. Yep. So it's really one of those statement questions. Um, you know, what's interesting that I've noticed about working with you guys and, and what you've been doing is, you know, these, con these, these product companies are really becoming content and utility companies, right? You're giving people great utility on a mobile phone with great content attached to it. You're giving people these great experiences by making lots and lots of content. You know, the big question to someone like me is, what is the balance now <laughs> that will emerge from you being a content company versus you being a marketing agent, right? Or a marketing company, right? Because marketing to me is an abstraction of a product that you know, I'm telling someone what to think versus this organic content that you're creating, right? And so it seems like there's a big shift happening, but how big is it really? Yeah, I mean, I guess in that way, we, we don't necessarily see the, the difference anymore. I mean, I, right. I think it is symbiotic now. I mean, it, it's tough for, for us to think about uh, in, in our paradigm of really being in touch with the people that we serve, to think about top-down marketing. You know, everything that we do now has to be symbiotic. And, um, you know, it's less about the, the tools that we use, and it's more about the, the stories that we tell. And that's why purpose is so strong in our organization and so embedded into our, our brand's DNA. I think you know emotions are always you know kind of true north, and being able to to stand for something more than just the, a product to buy, it's a belief to, to buy into. I think you know it, that was the transformational unlock for our organization yep. to really reimagine what marketing should be like moving forward. Do you think beauty sketches would have been as successful had you started on TV? Uh, possibly. I mean, I, I, I think it was nice that it was organic in a way, but I mean, there, there's definitely a blurring of the lines. I mean, we, there, was, there was paid media behind it. Sure. Yeah? Sure. And we just think about screens. Uh, it doesn't sure. necessarily matter whether the screen was a, a mobile phone screen or a television screen. Yeah? I think it would have been... Uh, I think the nice thing about it starting online, though, is that e either way it would have made it online regardless. I mean, right, like, at the right. end of the day, that is where culture happens. I mean, let's right. just face it. Um, I think that to that point, are we becoming a content company? I think a lot of, I think we're fooling ourselves to believe that we're becoming content companies. Huh. But we're not becoming content companies, although we need to. And part of the reason why I say that is because content companies monetize their content. We right. have not thought about monetization. And one of the things I was going to show was the Oreo app that we did, Twistlick and Dunk app. So quick story, two gum brands came to me and said, we want to build uh, iPhone games. I was like, that's great. Let me introduce you to some game companies that build games for a living. They were like, no, we're going to work with our creative agency. I was like, I personally would not do that <laughs> because they don't do that for a living. So they did $1.4 million. One got 23,000 downloads. One got 65,000 downloads. I was so pissed that I found a brand so that I could prove these guys wrong because that's the kind of colleague I am. And we took 175K and we went to Pickpock and we said, look, build an Oreo game, twist, lick, and dunk. We said three rules. One, don't desecrate the Oreo. Two, if you can get the ritual of twist, lick, and dunk in, then great. But three is the most important. Make it make money. That's what we cared about. So we cut a rev share. If you look at the game, there's ads that run in the game. You swipe, you twist, you lick, you dunk. Very much like cut the rope, kind of those basic games. More importantly, we have, to date, 4 million plus downloads, number one game in 12 app stores, and most important, 220,000 daily active uniques, which is higher than our 34 million Facebook fans. But more importantly, is that the app is actually cash positive. So I actually made back all my money. So the point is, is when you look at players like Red Bull, you know, they push yep. a guy out five years, $20 million, they turn around and they sell that to the BBC, an hour-long documentary. They're actually monetizing their money. I have 120 yep. million Facebook fans. I'm not monetizing yep. those guys. So until we actually think about media as investment dollars and reinvent the monetization model like P&G and Unilever yep. had with soap operas, we will not truly be content companies. Brilliant. 
That, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, Charlie. Can I just have a request? I know you want to wrap this up, but maybe as closing credits, if we can just show our, our video, just talking purpose. about purpose, I, was, I think that would be yeah, great. Oh, oh I, see, remember what I said at the start of this panel? I'm the boss in this, on this We just have suggestions. We're just I'm suggesting. I'm going to override him because I think purpose is one of the most important we'll, we'll things. End, we'll end on it because everyone's throwing, throwing barbs at me. Ladies and gentlemen, as you leave the the, uh, this auditorium, we will be playing um, the, the uh, purpose uh, this is the Project Sunlight work. Yep. This is our, our okay. corporate branding work. Exactly. Yeah. That is a reminder to all of us that although we talk a lot about media change and budgets and spend and gamification, fundamentally, brands do exist for the wider economic purposes of, of benefiting the economy, but increasingly are about benefiting society with utility and doing things right so as we leave the auditorium, we will play the Project Sun Sunlight uh, video, um, which says a lot about how Unilever is changing the business. And maybe next year, we'll be talking a little bit about Festival of Responsibility, as much as we'll be talking about Festival of Media. But let me wrap up. Finally, I thank you all for remaining in the room to see this amazing session. Have you enjoyed it? Yes. Woo! Bonnie and Boff, ladies and gentlemen. Oliver Luckett, JL Shooter from Unilever. That was your wrap up. It's about utility, it's about social. Thank you very much for attending this conference, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are scared. We are scared seeing the present. present we, we are scared for the future. You realize that you're someone else's protector. Maybe there's something you should know about the world in which your child will live. Something real. Something that's already happening. Every day, more and more food is being grown with a revolutionary method, care. A new technologies will make clean drinking water available to hundreds of millions. So this will probably be the famous water war they speak so much about. And illnesses that today affect millions of children a year will be prevented by simple, everyday products. Your child could have more possibilities of having a healthier heart than any living person today. And the same chance of a broken heart. No one can escape that. And by the time they find the right person, our children will have better chances of meeting their great-grandchildren than we ever did. Breathe calmly. Bring your child into this world. There has never been a better time to create a brighter future for everyone on the planet. For those yet to come. Where I come from, you don't get to see clean water like that. The world needs more good guys, and I like to think our, our baby will be one of the good guys. <laughs> but we have to change for them first. Right. We might not see it, but we won't maybe see it, our great-grandchildren great will see it. Great, great -grandchildren. <laughs> We're the characters in this story. <laughs> how the story pans out is based on how we behave in this story. So, yeah, we definitely, it's up to us to make a change, absolutely.